We're going to start. Yeah. We're going to start. Yeah. <laughs> well, in fact, we're, we're over time. That clock's slow. Right, good afternoon, everyone. I was looking at that clock, and I see it's a bit slow, so I've robbed you out of a minute, and I'll give it back to you by going 10 minutes over time. <laughs> so welcome back. Today we're going to talk about all these new planets being found around other stars. I put 4,000, but we'll see that's a slight underestimate compared to the number we've almost certainly actually found. But let us start with the most distant picture humans have ever taken. This is called the Hubble Extremely Deep Field. The Hubble Space Telescope repeatedly returned to the same piece of the sky over more than 20 years, taking a photograph over and over and over again, building it up to where we could see farther away, farther into the past, more faintly. This picture covers a piece of the sky that is the size that would be covered if you picked a tiny, tiny little pebble up off the ground and held it at arm's length it would cover that piece of the sky. This is much, much smaller in area than the moon. This is a tiny fraction the size of the moon in the sky. So a tiny piece of the sky. You know that when we look out into space, we look back into time. Because the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, it takes time to get here. In this picture, there are a few stars. There's one right there. And you can see the artificial spikes produced by the second mirror in the Hubble Space Telescope. There's another one there, and if you search very hard, you might find one more. Otherwise, the 5,500 objects in this thing you see, in this picture, are all galaxies. Galaxy like the Milky Way. 400 billion stars, all orbiting about a common center of gravity, and we've got 5,500 of them in this picture. The bright ones, here, 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 are about four billion light years away. You're looking four billion years into the past with the bright ones. With the faintest ones, we're looking 10 billion years into the past, almost back to the time when the very first stars were born. And as I mentioned to you yesterday, the James Webb Space Telescope will see those very first stars, and it's to be launched in 2021. We extrapolate from this picture and estimate that the Hubble Space Telescope can see about a trillion galaxies. And each galaxy has typically 400 billion stars. And I know because you're here, you're all interested in science and numbers. So will you quickly in your mind multiply 400 billion times a trillion? And you got a very big number, right? And yet out of all that vastness of stars and galaxies, there is one most beautiful object in the sky. It's unique so far. And it is, of course, our own beautiful blue planet, the Earth. And I purposely picked a picture with us in it, at least when the time the picture was taken. You know, one of the deepest questions we humans can ask is, are we alone? Is this the only place in the universe where there's life? Is this the only planet that has intelligence and creatures like us that look up at the universe, wonder about it, partially figure it out? I think you just answered that in your mind. You've got an opinion. I have an opinion, too, and it's very likely we have similar opinions, but I'm a scientist. I want more than an opinion. I want to know. And one of the first steps to finding out whether there's life elsewhere in the universe is go find planets like the Earth. We have a prejudice that life mostly needs water to form. Now, you will immediately think to yourself, well, maybe there are life forms that don't need water in any way whatsoever. And maybe but I don't know anything about those. I do know about biological life where the chemistry happens in the solution of water. And so let's look for planets like the Earth because we know that those can potentially harbor water. We built a space mission to do that. It's called the Kepler Space Mission. It's now over. It was launched in March of 2009. I'll show you the launch in a minute. I was there. And it ran for four years for the main mission. And then two of the gyroscopes which controlled it failed, and we thought the mission was over, but the engineers at Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado, very cleverly said, if you tip this telescope over on its side so that it's orbiting and it's pointing in the direction opposite where it's orbiting, we can use light pressure from the sun and some of the control gas and continue to control it. 
And that became the K2, Kepler-2 mission, and it ran four or five more years. On the 30th of October last year, Kepler was put to sleep. Why did we do that? The answer is it ran out of fuel. The tank ran dry. You know how big the fuel tank was on Kepler? This is a big space mission. It was carrying 12 liters of fuel. And the 12 liters lasted for nine years. It wasn't the main way of controlling it, and it wasn't its power source. In 1984, I was working here in South Africa, and at that time, I was making the most precise measurements of the brightness of stars of anybody on planet Earth. That led to an invitation to a meeting in San Diego, California, happens to be the town I was born in, uh, that's a coincidence, to go to a meeting to discuss the possibility of measuring the brightnesses of stars so precisely we could see the little dip in light with planets passing in front of them. And at the end of that meeting in San Diego, we said to the then relatively young man who was trying to do it, you haven't got a chance, just not possible. And he refused to accept that answer. His name's Bill Barucki. He is no longer a young man. And he went for years thinking, I'm going to go into space. He built a team. He applied to NASA for $600 million to build a space telescope. And the reviewers of the proposal said, this, this has got so many things wrong with it, forget it. But he took the criticism, and he got other team members, and he applied again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, year by year by year, until finally the proposal was polished, and the panel agreed, yes, and he got his $600 million. But at that point, you've got years building it. It takes a long time to get a mission into space. Bill Barucki spent his whole life, his whole working life, on this mission. It's been incredibly successful. There's a nice picture of him uh, shaking hands with Barack Obama at a word he got from the president. And tremendous success, but I have to tell you, none of that's ever guaranteed. Here is Kepler in the lab being built. Now, of course, this has to be done in incredibly clean conditions. So everybody's wearing a clean suit, their head's covered, their beards are covered in case they're old men with beards. So you don't want anything getting in there and contaminating the camera. But you can see the size of it. The mirror is only one meter in diameter. It's the size of one of the small telescopes up at Sutherland. Why does it cost $600 million? When you go into space, you figure an instrument costs a thousand times what it costs on the ground. Because if anything fails, there's no fixing it. On the ground, you just go in and fix it. You bring in a technician and repair it. You can't do that in space. And so you build it to be as fail-safe as possible, and all of that is tremendously expensive. These rooms, these clean rooms that that's sitting in, I don't know what that costs, but let me guess $50,000 a day to park that thing in there while you work on it. Those rooms are sophisticated and expensive. And so there's the telescope being built. Now, I went to the launch in Florida. A lot of us who work on the mission did. And there's a picture of it. I'm now going to give you the last 80 seconds of the launch. 80 seconds. RCO, report range go for launch. Range go for launch. Still see the air, you go for launch. Roger. 70 seconds. We're standing waiting for this thing to be ignited. So is Bill Barucki. He's got 25 years into the mission already. One minute and count. I can tell you this is not a relaxed circumstance. $600 million, your whole life, and somebody's taken your pet instrument and put it on top of an explosive rocket, and they're going to light the rocket. And it doesn't always work. So the tension level is very high. Try to imagine how we're feeling as we wait through this last minute. Read board here in the mission director center. Minus 15 seconds. 13 seconds. Green board. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Two engine, engine start, one, zero, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. We are standing in a large crowd of scientists working on this mission. 
And if you listen around, I didn't get a recording of it, you can just hear people saying, go, go, go. This can go wrong a long time into the launch. It didn't, this mission completely successful, went into its intended, intended orbit around the sun. So this satellite is orbiting the sun, not the Earth. It's away from the Earth's radiation field. It's away from the light of the Earth. It's in an orbit that takes 372.455 days to orbit the sun, a little bit farther from the sun than the Earth. So it takes a little bit longer to go around because as you all know expertly from yesterday, from Kepler's third law, the farther away you get, the slower the thing goes. And the mission pointed at a piece of the sky near the Milky Way in the northern hemisphere, near to the constellation Cygnus. There's the swan, the wings of the swan, the head here. There's Lyra and Vega, the bright stars of the northern hemisphere. Intentionally, it was close to the Milky Way, but not exactly in the Milky Way, because we wanted to have lots of stars, but not so many that they all crowded together and you couldn't tell one from the other. And during the first four years of the mission, these 42 independent cameras that made up the full camera observed 200,000 stars continuously for four years. I'm going to repeat this to you tomorrow, but from the ground here, when I used to work at Sutherland, I observed one star at a time. Precision, one part in 10,000. Only when it was dark, only when it wasn't raining, only when there were no clouds, and only when I had the telescope. Kepler, 200,000 stars, four years, no data gaps, at a precision of a part per million, not a part per 10,000. Everything you look at produces a new discovery. This is kids in a, in a candy store for us with this space mission. Now, after four years, when the gyroscopes failed, instead of pointing at the single point in Cygnus, the engineers brought the satellite down into the plane of its orbit, the same as the Earth's plane. And because the Earth is tipped to the galaxy with this galactocentric picture right here, that plane looks like a wave like this. And then for 90 days at a time, we looked at different patches of the sky until Kepler, by the end, had observed over 500,000 stars. And we will continue exploiting this data far, far into the future. But here, an artist's impression from the NASA office in California, NASA Ames, is a rather Van Gogh-like starry night of the dying Kepler looking out at all the planets and planet heaven out there that Kepler's discovered. As of just last month, the count was almost 4,000 confirmed planets around other stars, another almost 3,000 that are candidates, and I can tell you from experience that 95% of those will turn out to be real planets. So in reality, we're looking at nearly 7,000 planets here. And of those, not separately, nearly 3,000 are in planetary systems, solar systems. What's going to happen to Kepler in the future? Here's an animation from the NASA artists, and we'll look at what will happen to Kepler now that it's dead and just floating around the sun. I hope you're noticing Kepler's third law at work there. The inside thing goes faster. Catches up and then the gravity of the Earth whips Kepler into a lower orbit. And then Kepler's going faster. And so then Kepler goes around in a faster orbit until far into the future, actually the same year when we'll have a transit of Venus, Kepler catches back up with the Earth. And the gravity of the Earth then whips Kepler into the larger orbit, and then the Earth goes around and catches up with Kepler. <laughs> now, that may seem highly improbable, and we made it happen by putting Kepler into that orbit, but I have to tell you, the universe knows how to do this, too. These two little moons orbit Saturn. Names Epimetheus and Janus. Janus is 120 kilometers in diameter. Epimetheus is 180 kilometers in diameter. And their two orbits are in the same plane and are not separated by 100 kilometers. And so when the lower one catches up with the upper one, you think they're going to crash. But as they come close together, their mutual gravity whips the upper one into the lower orbit and the lower one into the upper orbit. They don't touch, and now the other one's going faster, and it goes around, catches up, and they swap places again. And that's been going on around Saturn for the life of the solar system. So this happens naturally in the universe, too.
Let's go back to Kepler. Kepler's job is to find planets in the habitable zone. And the habitable zone for a sun-like star is at a distance, we've got it painted in green here, where we could have liquid water. In this diagram, here's Venus, a little bit too close. So Venus, runaway greenhouse, surface temperature 470 Celsius, surface pressure 90 atmospheres, carbon dioxide atmosphere, no water, clouds of sulfuric acid. When I was a child, we thought Venus might be a place to look for life. But if you go to Venus, you're going to be fried, crushed, suffocated, and dissolved. There's no place to live. It is, by the way, the future of the Earth as the sun gets brighter in about one to two billion years. Farther from the sun, out where Mars is, Mars is right on the edge of what we would call the habitable zone. So that's what we're looking for. Planets like the Earth orbiting at the distance the Earth is from the sun around sun-like stars. That was the goal. What we discovered, we already knew, most stars in the galaxy are tiny little red dwarfs, much fainter than the sun. Most of the planets we've been finding in the habitable zone are orbiting about tiny little red dwarfs. And we're going to meet some of those in this lecture. There's a transit of Venus. We met transits of Venus in the first lecture, uh, in the historical lecture, and there's a real transit of Venus passing in front of the sun. Now, let's think of that as another star with another planet. When the planet passes in front of the star, it blocks out some of the starlight. That's why Bill Barucki was looking for such precision, so we could see the little dip as some of the starlight was blocked out. How much light's blocked out? The area of the planet compared to the area of the star. I'll tell you tomorrow how we know how big the star is, but knowing how big the star is, that tells us how big the planet is. And that's how we begin to characterize the planet. This plot shows the size of planets. This is the size of the Earth. Here's Neptune, four times bigger radius. Jupiter, 11 times bigger. And this shows how long it takes the planet to orbit its star. One day, 10 days, 100. Here's the Earth, 365 days, one Earth size. And you'll notice we haven't found any exact Earth analogs around a star like the Sun. Before Kepler, you can see some dark blue dots in here. We had found some planets, mostly giant planets like Jupiter, but Kepler has found the bulk of planets around other stars. We now know there are more stars in the galaxy than there are, sorry, there are more planets in the galaxy than there are stars. We also know that virtually all stars have planets. That is absolutely new knowledge. 10 to 20 years ago, we knew nothing about that. And now we understand planets are just proliferate all over the galaxy. This plot's slightly different, but important. It plots how hot the star is, the planet's orbiting. And so this little red dwarf is the star that's down on the lower end of that thing I showed you yesterday, the main sequence, the stars burning hydrogen to make their energy. So it's got a temperature of only 3,500 degrees. Here's a sun-like star up here at 6,000. So this is how hot the star is. This is the energy received by the planet compared to the Earth's energy from the sun. And this green zone is the habitable zone. The dark green is optimistically maybe a habitable zone. And the circles show you the size of the planets and where they lie in the plot. The Earth is on here. It's right there. It's that tiny little thing right there. Here's Venus, a little too close to the sun. There's little Mars out there. And you'll see we are actually finding lots of planets in the habitable zone. Going back to a plot with how big the planet is versus the time it takes to go around its star, we call these giant planets up here, if they're far from their star, they're just cold gas giants. That's like Jupiter. But many of them are close to their stars, orbiting in only days. We call those hot Jupiters, and they were a surprise. Our theory said that such planets wouldn't exist. 20 years ago, when we were just thinking about what solar systems should be like, we thought they would all be like ours, with little rocky things close to the star where it's hot, and the big gaseous cool things farther out. Well, many planetary systems have hot Jupiters, and we now have an understanding that the planets, in interacting with the gas cloud they form out of, can actually migrate by friction into the inner solar system before their stars evaporate them. These are the ocean worlds and ice giants, and then down here are the rocky planets we're after. If the rocky planets get too close to their star, they get melted. And you probably don't want to live on a planet where there's only molten lava. There is a laboratory called the um, Planetary Habitability Laboratory. It's actually housed at the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico, but it's a very good website if you would like to pursue some of this planetary stuff I'm showing you today. This plot comes from them. The number is an 
index that tells you how like the Earth a planet is. And so here's the Earth, and the Earth is exactly like the Earth, so it gets a 1. Jupiter's not very much like the Earth. It gets 0.12 by their calculation. But notice up here, the nearest planet to us is orbiting the star Proxima Centauri, the nearest star. And it gets a similarity index of 0.85. The very nearest star has got a planet that's very close to being like the Earth in the habitable zone. We're going to come back to that. You recognize this picture? The very first Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, the fictional character, walks out on his planet, Tatooine, and looks up in the sky, and his planet orbits two stars, and he's watching a double sunset. What fun. Would you like to live on a planet with two stars that you can watch them both go down and come up? If you're the right distance, the conditions can be right. Science fiction, not anymore. We call these, not Tatooines, but circumbinary planets, and we found lots of them with Kepler. First one, Kepler-16b. Now, what's our nomenclature? The stars we're looking at with Kepler, if they turned out to be interesting with planets, they were given a number. And so this particular star, which is very similar to the sun and a red dwarf, is called Kepler-16a. That's the star. And the first planet found is Kepler-16 little b. Another planet found would be Kepler-16c. So it's a very simple nomenclature. There's a double star. Here's another one, Kepler-35, orbiting a double star. If there is intelligent life out there on other planets, if it happens, then somewhere out there in the galaxy, somebody lives on a planet, and they get to watch double sunsets and double sunrise. And I have to say that I am envious. And Natalie Battaglia is a top scientist in planetary exoplanet astronomy. She was at NASA Ames. She's now a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. And she and her team found one of the first rocky planets, Kepler-10b. Kepler-10a, the star, is a, virtually identical to the sun. And she, since she was working at NASA Ames, was able to get the artists at NASA Ames to make a movie illustrating the science. And I want to watch that movie with you, and then we'll talk about the reality. The American writer Mark Twain once said, science is fascinating. You get such a wholesale return of conjecture out of such a trivial investment of fact. <laughs> he was having a dig at scientists, but you must be thinking that looking at that movie. What is the Kepler satellite scene? It's seen the shadow from the planet pass across the telescope. And from that, the artists have made a movie about a rocky planet, molten on one side with lava flow flowing down the canyons, frozen on the other side, material being blasted off the surface by a wind from the star. And you say, well, oh, come on. How could you know all that? And the answer is, we can know all that, and I'm going to show you how. So here's the nitty gritty of how this transit method works. Cartoon on the left, we've got a cartoon star. The planet passes across the star, and as it does, 
the starlight drops by a small amount. Here's the real light curve for Kepler 10b from the Kepler mission. There's the dip. The amount of light loss depends on the area of the planet, pi r squared, you'll remember that from school, divided by the area of the star, pi r squared for the star. If we know the radius of the star, tomorrow you'll find out how we know that. Then we get the radius of the planet. For this planet, 40% bigger than the Earth. Now we need to do something else. We need the mass. How do we find mass? I thought you'd chant out Kepler's third law for me. <laughs> we spent all day yesterday on that. Kepler's third law. We go to some of the world's biggest telescopes on the ground, frequently the Keck telescope in Hawaii, and observe the star. And as the planet goes around the star, it tugs the star back and forth. The star comes towards us and goes away. We measure that in the velocity of the star. Here's the velocity. It's only meters per second. It's walking speed. But we have such precise instruments now, we can measure the star coming towards us and going away over the orbit of the planet. And applying Kepler's third law, we get the mass of the planet. It's quite a bit bigger than the Earth, nearly five Earth masses. And then we put both of those together to get the density. Density is the mass. We determine that from Kepler's third law. The volume, well, we found the radius from the transit. And volume is just 4 thirds pi r cubed. We've got r. We just calculate the volume. The density of that planet, 9 grams per cubic centimeter. That's the density of the core of the Earth. And the core of the Earth is made out of iron. That planet is mostly made out of iron. That's not a gas giant like Jupiter. You know, if you took Saturn, it's gigantic. But Saturn has a density lower than the density of water. It would float in the ocean, except that's a ridiculous thing to say because it's so much bigger than Earth. Those big gas giants have very low density. This says rocky planet, mostly iron. So that's good in the movie. We've got a rocky planet. It's mostly iron. The planet is orbiting the star in a very short period. I didn't tell you about that. Anybody remember how long it takes Mercury to orbit the sun? I heard you all say 88 days. And Mercury's very hot. This planet orbits its star in 22 hours. And as a consequence, the tides from the star have locked one face towards the star, just like one face of the moon's locked on the Earth. And that face will rise to a temperature of about 1,800 Celsius. And if I were back here teaching at UCT, my first year undergraduates could learn to calculate that temperature. It's not difficult. So we know that side of the planet's molten. The other side facing away is going to be frozen. And that star, like the sun, will have a wind blowing off of it, knocking material off the surface, as you saw in the movie. That happens with Mercury. Mercury's got a very thin atmosphere from material knocked off the surface from the wind of the sun. The evidence in the movie was very good deduction from what we know from the radial velocity, Kepler's third law, and the transit. We have found entire solar systems now with Kepler. This is Kepler 90 system. 90A is the star in comparison with our solar system. These planets are drawn correctly to scale in terms of size, but not in terms of distance from their star. That will be in the next slide. So this is only correct in size comparison. And Kepler has Kepler 90b, c, the tiny one was found late, so d, e, f, g, h, and then i, the last one found in here. And you'll see it's got some tiny planets close in and some big giants further out, very similar to our solar system. Uh, but the distance scale is quite different. This is our solar system here on the right, the sun with Mercury's orbit, Venus, and Earth. And the entire Kepler 90 system out to the outer planets is closer to its star than the Earth is to the Sun. No habitable planets here, but a very interesting solar system. This is a great find. TRAPPIST is a small set of ground-based telescopes. I forget what their acronym is, but they intentionally made it something catchy. And TRAPPIST-1 was a star around which an entire solar system was found. This is now two years ago. But it was published as front page article in the world's most prestigious science magazine, Nature. Seven planets orbiting this little tiny red dwarf, tiny, tiny faint star, but these seven planets are close in. Three of them 
are at the right distance to have liquid water, not just one. The solar system's got three planets that might harbor life. Astronomers around the world worked on this discovery. One of them is Daniel Holdsworth, who's my current postdoc in the UK. I currently have got a 300,000 pound grant to exploit test data. I'll tell you about that at the end of the talk. And the lion's share of that money goes into paying Dan. And he recently had a very good grant from the NRF here in South Africa and spent six months out here. And during one of his observations at Sutherland, he was in the right place at the right time to be an observer on this. And so he's a co-author on this announcement, which hit front page news, at least in science news, around the world. The day the press release came out, I think Dan did six TV and radio programs that day. Uh, he was really doing extremely well off of the BBC and all the other stations calling him up, wanting to know about this amazing planet system. Well, you can go to the Exoplanet Travel Bureau now at NASA. Just put it into Google. Look up Exoplanet Travel Bureau. And they will provide you with posters of planetary systems elsewhere. And if we look at TRAPPIST-1 here, planet hop from TRAPPIST-1e, you've got three planets with liquid water. What if they all developed life? What if all three developed intelligence? Uh, interplanetary war for sure. No, maybe not. Use your imagination. If you could read down on the bottom here, I will tell you what this travel brochure says. It says, this planet is voted the best hab zone, habitable zone, vacation, within 40 light years of the Earth. So put it on your list of adventures to come in the future. For you here in Cape Town, this is a familiar part of the sky. The Southern Cross and the two pointers, Alpha and Beta Centauri. Alpha Centauri is a double star. One of the stars very like the sun, one a little bit smaller, going around in a very close orbit. And then there is a third star orbiting Alpha Centauri around the two called Proxima. It's way over here. And this picture, it's a much, much longer exposure. Um, Proxima Centauri is about 10,000 times fainter than these other two. You need a pretty good sized telescope to see Proxima because it's a tiny little red dwarf barely burning hydrogen, enough to keep it glowing. And from ground-based observations, just mm, two years ago, 2017, a group of astronomers found a planet orbiting Proxima Centauri. It's at the right distance for liquid water. Wonderful. Here's an artist's impression. There's little Proxima, as the artist imagines from the surface of the planet, but Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf, and so there's no yellow or white light. There's only red light on the ground. You can be sure that if life evolves there, it will evolve eyes that see red and infrared. That's where all the light is. You and I have light, eyes that see in the visible, because that's where the sun puts out most of its energy. If you had evolved infrared eyes, there wouldn't be a lot to see. And so around the, this planet, on this planet, if there is life, we expect it to be seeing in the red and the infrared. There in the distance is Alpha Centauri A and B. What are we going to do? How are we going to find out more? Well, let's go back to good old Yuri Milner. You met him yesterday. He's the one who made the Milner Prize, the breakthrough prize that Jocelyn Bell got. And he put $100 million of his money. He's put, he put $100 million into radio telescopes to look for intelligent life. Um, we haven't succeeded in doing that, but look for signals from other civilizations. If you could take our big radio telescopes here on the Earth, if you just took Meerkat sitting up near Carnarvon here in South Africa out to a planet orbiting Sirius, a fairly nearby star, and turned it around and looked back, Sirius is about 10 light years away. And if you had Meerkat out at Sirius looking at the Earth, you would be picking up the television programs broadcast 10 years ago here. Would you conclude that there's intelligent life on the Earth? That's a decision. We've been looking for signals like that. Planets leaking radio radiation, something to indicate something's living there. We haven't found them yet, but the search goes on and it gets more sophisticated with bigger searches and maybe that'll happen. This is another idea. What Milner has funded there called Breakthrough Starshot is the idea, let's go to Proxima Centauri B, the planet, and let's go quickly. He poached a, an acquaintance of mine. When I was a student in Texas in the 1970s, I used to go to the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona, and there was a student there that I went to parties with and socialized with by the name of Simon P. Warden. Pete Warden's what he's gone by, by his whole over his whole life. 
In my youth, and even now, I was extremely liberal, strongly anti-Vietnam War and all the protests that went on. Pete grew up to be a two-star general in the US Air Force. He ran Ronald Reagan's Star Wars program. Pete's specialty is finding near-Earth asteroids that might hit the Earth. But he likes to blow things up. <laughs> and I ran into him in Hawaii just a couple years ago, and he, he was with the governor of Hawaii and some other important business people, showing him around the telescopes. And I cornered him, and I said, Pete, I'm worried about you. You're trying to develop technology to go out and find asteroids and deflect them so they'll miss the Earth and save us from apocalypse. And I said, if you develop that technology, you'll be able to go get an asteroid that wasn't going to hit, deflect it, and make it hit, and get an explosion a billion times bigger than your biggest bomb. I said to him, I'm more scared of you than I am of the asteroids. And he laughed. He said, oh, don't worry. He said, you can't do it. If something's coming towards the Earth, push it in any direction, it'll miss. If it's not coming towards the Earth, the Earth is such a tiny little target out there, we just can't do it. And so he told me two things. He told me that you can't do it, it's hard to do, and so we're safe in that sense. But he also told me he's thinking about it, and that concerns me. What is Yuri Milner's idea? Well, Yuri Milner poached Pete Warden. When Pete got out of the Air Force, he became the director of NASA Ames in California, Silicon Valley. And Yuri Milner just hired him, took him away from NASA, and made him the head of this project. It's a serious project, and the idea is an entire swarm of nanosatellites. Each one will be about the size of the SIM card in, in your telephone. A swarm of nanosatellites, nano a little cluster orbiting the Earth, and then giant lasers on the ground will shine on these little nanosatellites, and light produces pressure. And they're so light that in principle, the calculations indicate you can use the light to accelerate these nanosatellites towards Proxima Centauri up to nearly the speed of light. They'll get there in under five years. Now, you can't slow them down when they get there, so they go by very fast, but as they go by, they all turn and take pictures. And then, as an ensemble, they've got enough power to beam that picture, those pictures back to the Earth. That takes another five years, and in comes real pictures of the surface of an alien planet that might have water on it. That could happen within the next couple of decades. That can happen within the, the lifetimes of many people in this room. You might actually get to see pictures of an alien planet with water on its surface. This is a tough engineering problem. We don't know if it's going to work. Calculations are OK, but the engineering's tough. There's a project here in South Africa called WASP. It's up at Sutherland. It's the Wide Angle Survey for Planets. And very cleverly, the people who build it just took a bunch of very expensive but off-the-shelf camera lenses, put them together in a cluster so they can look at a big piece of the sky, and they take pictures of the sky all night, every night when it's clear, and they've picked up lots of planets. So WASP has found many planets. One of them, WASP-12, is a super Jupiter, hot Jupiter close to its star, and the star is actually blowing material off the surface of WASP-12, and that produces more than just a dip. You can see also see the effect of the material being ablated off the surface. As a big planet like that passes in front of its star, we can then look for starlight coming through the atmosphere of the planet, and we can then see the imprint, the fingerprint, of the atmosphere of that planet on the starlight. And then we can tell what the planet atmosphere is made out of. We've done that for some of these exoplanets. They're hot Jupiters. We're seeing hydrogen and helium and methane and ammonia, just like in Jupiter. What we're looking for is a planet like the Earth with an atmosphere like ours. What are you breathing now? 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% argon, a little bit of water vapor, a little bit of carbon dioxide and some other unmentionable gases. That's not how the Earth's atmosphere started. We started as almost pure carbon dioxide. That dissolved into the ocean. We ended up with nitrogen. And then life produced the oxygen. Life still produces methane. Half of all the methane in the atmosphere comes out of the back end of termites. The other half comes out of the front end of cows. And it burns the methane in the atmosphere oxidizes with the oxygen. It's not permanent. The fact that it's here tells you there's a source. There are inorganic sources, but the amount in the Earth's atmosphere says there's life there. All we have to do is get a spectrum of another planet. We can do that with our telescopes. And if it's got nitrogen, oxygen, methane all together, we're going to say somebody lives there. 
I don't mean life like us, not intelligent life, not necessarily, but something's living there. That's what we're looking for now with these planets. We want to find a spectroscopic signature that shows that life is there. At the moment, Hubble Space Telescope is a great instrument for doing that. It's being used. Even better is going to be the James Webb Space Telescope, now delayed until March 2021, but it will go up six and a half meter diameter mirror, much bigger than the Hubble, way out beyond the moon for its orbit, away from the Earth. It's an infrared telescope, but infrared's a good place to look at planets. They're cool this thing may actually detect what we're looking for. On the ground, we're also trying to do this. Now, let me just digress a moment and take you to Chile. I will be going to Chile in June and July this year. I've got a visiting scientist position at the European Southern Observatory for a month that just happens to coincide with the total eclipse of the sun going through the observatory. And uh, when I go out to Chile, I observe with what's called the Very Large Telescope on Paranol in the Atacama Desert. This is the Atacama Desert. It looks like the surface of Mars. And if you go there, nothing lives there. There aren't any plants, no bugs, no insects, no snakes, no lizards, no birds, no mammals. It's just rock, just like Mars. It's so dry. That's why we're there for the astronomy. Now, when I finish observing, the telescopes are over here. I can drive down in the morning, but sometimes after a night's work, I like to walk down. It's about two point, uh, it's four kilometers down this pathway right here, to our residencia, which is mostly buried underground for thermal control, and also we want to keep all the light in. No lights allowed out. And so there is a dome with a curtain that can be pulled back to let light in during the day, but it's a complete blackout at night. And from over here, I walk down a ramp into the ground and open two doors into a vestibule. It's like going into a warehouse. And then I open another set of double doors and it drops two stories through the tropical rainforest down to the swimming pool with a restaurant to feed 180 people and bedrooms and offices and computers. This is one of the world's most exotic hotels. And I'm really sorry to tell you, it's not open to the public. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic place to visit. You possibly have seen it before. Uh, maybe eight years ago or so, James Bond blew it to bits at the end of this film. If you remember that film, Quantum of Solace, it finished at our residencia. Fortunately, the fire and the burning it to bits was done in a studio, not in the real residencia. This is an artist's impression of the telescope now under construction near Perinal, uh, Mount um, Armazonas. We're building the European Extremely Large Telescope. It will have a diameter of 39 meters. It's got the same kind of mirrors that the Southern African Large Telescope has at Sutherland. Many small hexagonal mirrors all put together. This one will have 960 mirrors in it, each of them the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. And with that size telescope for spectroscopy, we could do things the space telescopes can't do. Now, we are not planning to build a replica of Big Ben next to it. That's simply to put it to scale so you can see how big it is. This project's estimated to cost about a billion euros. It's under construction. It's on the way. Uh, some funding's still needed to finish it, but it's expected to come in before the, before the telescope's finished. And so within a few years from the ground, we'll also be detecting these atmospheres of planets. I promised in the program that I would talk to you about TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Now, when I promised that was many, many months ago, and TESS had only just been launched and I was taking a chance that something would come back in time. It did, but it's still very early days. TESS was launched last April, and it has begun to discover planets. TESS was launched into a very eccentric orbit. Here's the Earth, this is the Moon's orbit, and you'll remember from Kepler's laws, planets orbiting the Sun, satellite orbiting the Earth, orbits on an ellipse, in this case, the Earth's at one focus. And so TESS went out on several elliptical orbits like this, and it was time so that finally it came out here just when the moon was passing by. And the gravity of the moon flung it out and dropped it down here, and then some burns from its fuel and its rockets then had it settle in to its final mission orbit here. That mission orbit takes it close to the Earth and then far out to the moon's orbit. Now, we don't want the moon to pass by again it'll disturb it. And so it has a period exactly half the time it takes the moon to orbit the Earth. So each time TESS comes out here, the moon is either there or over here, but never there. 
Why this long orbit? Get away from the Earth most of the time. That's a good place to be to observe. But drop in closer where you can dump the data back and get a better data transfer rate closer to the Earth. The test camera is vastly wider field than Kepler. Kepler looked at a little tiny piece of the sky, just 105 square degrees. Here's the apparent full moon in the sky. Here is one single CCD in the test camera, and that little circle right there is the size of the full moon. Each camera in test has got four CCDs, 24 degrees across, and there are four cameras, and so the test field of view over here, in a single shot, it gets the entire sky encompassing the constellation of Orion. So it gets huge wide field coverage. The problem with the Kepler mission is that in order to get lots of stars, Bill Barucki and his team planned for it to look at a piece of the sky where the star d density was high, and most of the Kepler stars are two to 3,000 light years away. They're very faint. It's hard to follow up from the ground and look at the planets. TESS is going to find planets around the very nearest stars, so we're coming in close, bright stars and close planets. Here's the observing pattern. With the four cameras, you can get a strip of the sky that goes from the pole down to the ecliptic that happens to be the orbital plane of the satellite. That's the Earth's orbit around the sun. And so for 27 days, you observe a sector, move over another 27 days, another 27, and in one year, you sweep out an entire half of the sky and then flip the telescope over and do the other half. And very fortunately, from my point of view, the mission controllers decided to do the southern hemisphere first. When I was here in South Africa, I discovered a class of stars that are the most peculiar stars in the sky. I'll tell you a little bit more about them tomorrow. We have found about 60 of these intriguingly interesting stars that many, many people work on over the last 40 years since I first found them. But now with TESS, an entire group of us proposed that we observe 1,200 candidate stars of the kind that I like best, that I discovered, that was approved, and those data are now pumping down into this computer you see sitting right here. And I can't tell you how happy I am about it. It has been discovering planets. First announcements are coming out now, and there's the very first paper. There's the first planet, a super-Earth planet, transiting a star called Pi Mensae. What is this constellation name? Anybody know the constellation Mensa? That's the genitive, the possessive form in Latin. So the constellation is Mensa, Table, Table Mountain. Table Mountain's constellation. And the tablecloth is a large Magellanic cloud. So you look at the tablecloth, it's a large Magellanic cloud. Who did that? An astronomer named the Abbe de la Caille in the 1700s came to the Southern Hemisphere, here to Cape Town, and the Southern constellations hadn't been named by Northerners, they'd never seen them. And so he came here and he named Southern constellations, and given it was 1700s, he called them Triangle, Telescope, Clock, Table Mountain. So we've got our own constellation up there, those of us from Cape Town here, and the planets are being found. This is all very new, and I can't give you lots of new results from TESS yet, because they're just coming out. The data for me have just come in a couple of weeks ago, and I even got some really good data for myself while I was on the ship sailing here on the Queen Elizabeth, and this morning I just took a screenshot of my own computer. This is the file, my file, for these rapidly oscillating peculiar A stars I discovered. And there's a whole list of the various stars I'm working on with various notes, but notice the dates over here, a couple of them that I analyzed and sent the data back to my, my team, I did while I was on the ship coming down here. And so this, this is gonna keep me occupied for the next few years for sure, with amazing discoveries as this mission goes. We expect it to be extended. Well, we don't think it's actually going to end in two years. We fully expect an extension and many years of good service out of it. But there's more coming. This planetary astronomy, exoplanets, has become so important in our understanding of the universe and to scientists. We've got another mission being launched by the European Space Agency. TESS is a little tiny set of telescopes with four little cameras. Plato has got 54 cameras, and each of them is bigger than any of the four in TESS. It's to go up in 2024, so that's perhaps not my career goal to be working on this, since it'll be working right into the 2030s. And that's getting a bit late for me, but for my postdoc, this is probably the major part of his career when that goes up. Now, I told you that we're looking for the signature of life around other planets. I think we're going to find that. How soon? 
Let me be brave. Maybe 10 years. Maybe tomorrow. I think in our lifetimes, you're going to wake up one morning and the news is going to be, we are not alone. There's life somewhere else in the universe. Thanks for your attention this afternoon. Now, Nicholas, are you here? He's abandoned me. I'm going to bring the lights up, folks, before we take questions so we can see each other, if I can figure them out. Don't go away. I'm not. I'm just hiding. There we go. That's better. Okay. Questions. Right, the question was, how long does or the orbit of TESS take to go around the Earth? It's exactly half the orbital period of the Moon, and that is not the month. The Moon orbits the Earth in 27.32 days. The reason the month is 29.53 is the Earth's orbiting the Sun. TESS doesn't care about that. So the Moon goes around 27.32 days, TESS exactly half of that. So what's half of 27.32, 13.86? Goes around twice for each lunar orbit. Right, the question is, what will be the signature that says there's life? To me, it will be oxygen and methane, water vapor, nitrogen, something that looks like the Earth's atmosphere. There may be other signatures for life, but if we see the signature the same as here on the Earth, where the oxygen has been produced by life, the methane's produced by life, they're unstable together, but the planet maintains it, that will be the proof I think we're going to find. You know, there's now, I'm, I'll take your question in a minute, there's now a field called astrobiology. Astro, sounds a bit impossible, doesn't it? What it is, is it's biologists who work on extremophiles thinking about what life might be like elsewhere in the universe. And we've got an astrobiology center at the University of Edinburgh. In fact, we should probably talk to summer school and see if we can coax the director to come out and do a summer school course, because he's a brilliant speaker and absolutely fascinating. His specialty is extremophiles, things here on the Earth that live in water that's boiling, that live underground, like in the mines up in the Witwatersrand, where it's only off the interior heat of the Earth, three kilometers underground, that live in highly acidic conditions, that live in anaerobic conditions. We're looking at the extreme possibilities for life to think about what might be found elsewhere, and that's called astrobiology. Very back. Right, the square kilometer array being built in Carnarvon will be a long time till it's completed, but already there's the Meerkat and the Karoo Pathfinder that's operational. But that is looking at such long wavelengths that there's very little radiation, radio radiation, that comes from the planets. The thing that the square kilometer array could do, and Meerkat could do, would be to pick up intelligence signals from somebody communicating by radio, and Yuri Milner just gave them $100 million to do that. They're working on that. So you, you got that right. <laughs> you can look for intelligent life with that telescope, and it, the money's there. He just gave it to them. But that's radio telescope. That's it's a radio telescope. And the planet itself doesn't radiate very much in the radio. Yeah, very little light comes off the planet naturally in radio. Yeah, but that signal, that, that radio signal, would have been sent so many hundreds of years ago. Oh, the, yeah, the statement is the radio signal would have been sent a long time ago. If it's 100 light years away, 100 years ago, we just want to know they're there. Now, you want to talk to them? Then when you see the signal, you say, hi. And 100 years later, they see that you've said hi, and they say hello. And 100 years later, you get the answer. There's no way to speed that up. <laughs> and so don't worry about them coming here and abducting you and doing weird things to you in their spaceships. Stars are just too 